lovely to see you all and thank you so much for making us so welcome to come along today and, and share our story with you. Hopefully we can answer some of the questions that have been raised and certainly ask plenty of questions um, when that opportunity comes forward. Um, just going to give a bit of a quick whiz through about what we've done, I guess our story, um, just so we can have a bit of a starting point uh, and just expressing our gratitude to the elders of, of the lands that we farm in Western Australia and the opportunity to be immersed amongst that. Um, we've had some wonderful experiences and we're very grateful for um, the traditional uh, custodians and what they've uh, brought to the country and the wisdom that we're <coughs> learning from them even greater now. A family farm, um, we were of Ian's a fourth generation farmer and I'm a third generation farmer but we didn't inherit any land so that's been an interesting starting point um, and we were speaking to a young fella last night who was uh, starting from scratch as well and just want to give him full courage to go ahead and, and do it. it it can be achieved um, and a very interesting journey along the way we originally spent a bit of time in the Kimberley and I guess that probably just opened our mind a little bit to other ways of thinking um, that we probably didn't really recognise at the time. But now that we've been back and looked back at how our life has unfolded, there was a, obviously an opening there, a portal of stuff that um, helped us perhaps get a bit more in contact with our intuitive side um, and accepting the wisdom of the land that came forward over our time. Started with a very small farm. We put a $100,000 deposit on um, 1,600 acres in the Wild Catcham Shire. Uh, fairly saline country. Um, yeah, not the choice block in the district, but it was a good starting point right next door to my parents so we could borrow machinery from them and work alongside them to get started. The 90s when we started was uh, not bad seasons. We had some a run of good seasons through the 90s and we were conventionally farming at that point, um, doing quite well at that. But there was a few little niggly bits that we weren't terribly happy with. Um, one was we were doing soil tests um, fairly regularly at that time and getting a um, fertility program put forward by an agronomist and so forth. And each year it seemed that the recommendations were creeping up and then you'd do a plant tissue test and there'd be deficiencies in phosphorus or calcium or whatever else it might have been in the crop, even if, even if it was showing fine on a soil test. And we thought, well, something's obviously affecting the way those plants can access whatever was in the soil, wasn't getting into the plants. Um, but also there wasn't much rooting depth. We had, the soils were fairly compacted. You'd come into a spring if the rain didn't fall, which didn't fall all the time, very, you know, it was fairly dry finishes a lot of the time very poor rooting depth and the crops would tip off and fall over quickly. So even though that probably only happened two or three times out of 10 years in the 90s, you flip it to the 2000s and it was happening seven or eight times out of the 10 years. So um, fortunately we started thinking about ways to change things early on. Um, but from a very small base with a low capital base at that point, um, the farm consultant we've engaged in the beginning said you're best off getting out before you get started because you'll never make it but um, I guess that doesn't really look at how the people are that are involved and I guess that's where it all comes down to your personal fortitude and what you want to you know get out of life um, and creating your own resilience to have a crack at things and, and not be afraid because yeah, at the end of the day you might as well have a go. In 2001 um, yeah, we'd been questioning a little bit about what had been going on in the 90s, even though we'd been successful conventional farmers at that point, there was those niggling questions. And we were fortunate enough to go to a four-day event in Fremantle where Dr Elaine Ingham and Dr Arden Anderson were presenting. And that was a really great eye-opening event because, as I said, we didn't have a big capital base. Um, we were purchasing, slowly purchasing our own machinery. Um, Yes, we didn't have a lot of money to splash around with newfangled ways of doing stuff. Um, and Elaine talked about that microbial um, workforce in the soil and what they could do for us as far as nutrient cycling and rebuilding um, a healthy soil community and affect the plant community that grew on top um, so that those plants were resilient to 
climatic shocks or pests or diseases and um, Arden in particular talked about, you know, as you get the BRICS levels of the plants up and how that translated to, um, you know, the plant health but also then the health of the food that you were producing. Um, and it sort of really made a, a lot of sense to us because I guess as farmers, it hadn't been promoted, I guess, that we were actually making food, although of course we were, it was obvious that that's what we were doing as farmers, growing food, but some of the methods of achieving that um, didn't really quite correlate well with um, healthy food when you looked at the level of um, pesticides or herbicides uh, that were being recommended. Um, towards the end of the 90s, um, there'd been a few rust outbreaks and there was a fair bit of fungicide application going on. So it sort of wasn't really making a good clear picture that how could we continue in that kind of way of farming and still produce a healthy food product. So it was really great to hear from those people about how we might be able to transform what we were doing um, to focus on that healthy food outcome and healthy um, human outcome. My background personally as an occupational therapist, I was working with um, children, seeing a lot of um, developmental disorders and autism and all sorts of things working with them and even doing a, a lot of preschool assessments and seeing a physical decline in the children and their strength and their endurance, their capacity to pay attention in class and thinking, well, what on earth's going on? Um, and you're discussing these things with colleagues and thinking, well, there's a breakdown happening somewhere and we just had to try and get to the bottom of it. Um, and I guess as farmers, producing food and an environment um, is some of our key roles. We also, uh, fortunately at the same time, um, looked at some newspaper articles about a nutriculture, which is actually Jane Slattery's business at the time. Um, and she was talking about using free choice minerals with livestock at that point to boost the animals health and then how they integrate with their landscape um, to improve their environment within. So um, using the animals, I guess, effectively as a tool to heal landscape, but at the same time enhancing the health of that animal and the food products or fibre products that they were producing. And that sort of uh, brought a whole new realm to it as well. So whilst we started off using free choice minerals with Jane and um, understanding how to recognise healthy progress in the animals, um, instantly removing them from having grain supplements, um, from drenching and all those kind of things that would affect their gut microbiome. Um, yeah, it was a really interesting um, start to our journey and that's from there we've looked more then at recognising the wisdom of those animals and that then recognising our ability to use intuition through what the animals have taught us. So in the beginning, how do we go from having a 1,600 acre farm um, and building to the, the level where at now. And basically we just had to go the extra mile. There's been times there where we've had farms, um, the northern end to the southern end had a couple hundred kilometres um, in between. And our home farm fortunately at that time was in the middle so we could sort of go either way. Um, but having that distance to travel and would have short term leases or be adjusting animals or share farming properties, there was yeah, as it says up there, um, 28 years, but covering 35 different properties in that time. So a lot of opportunity to see different landscape, see what other farmers were doing as you're driving past, because you're going past every day, of course, checking sheep or checking crops or whatever you might need to do. So a lot of opportunity to observe landscape change and um, what was going on around the place. Just a couple of pictures there of some of the typical landscapes that you might see in the wheat belt of WA um, in the autumn time. So after a, a dry summer, that some of them, you know, just been overgrazed or just left bare. Uh, some of it chemically fallowed. Not a lot of capacity for water capture or infiltration. Um, but once you can start to change things uh, and getting some of the native grasses and plants back and getting that land covered, it can really make a fairly significant transformation. Oops. And once again, just some more examples there of 
country that we took on in 2020 um, with lots of wind erosion through that was caused through uh, deep ripping. Um, there's lots of compaction issues in Western Australia at the moment with soil structure collapse um, and resorting to deep ripping and chemical fallow to conserve moisture, um, but perhaps we need to actually capture it in the first place because um, it certainly can look at the soil capping occurring there. There's not going to be a lot of water infiltration on a soil like that. A lot of it's just going to run off. Um, so really you're probably better off building that capacity of that soil to be holding the moisture in the first place. Um, and we found that through having those root systems penetrating deeply um, has been what's enabled that. But salinity too is a massive issue in Western Australia and for any of you who um, are flying in there to look at it from the air is pretty scary. Um, and certainly a lot of the farms that we've got have got some big salinity issues and getting green plants growing across that landscape is just imperative for us to not continue that decline. So I guess, um, and we'll discuss a little bit more about that, it's just really encouraging as many plants as we possibly can get, whether it be through cropping or native pastures, cover cropping, multi-species stuff. We've sort of grown that journey as we've progressed um, and got as much cover out there as possible, um, even though some of the seasons haven't been conducive to that well, but it seems to unfold and improve with time. Natural intelligence itself, I guess, is for us, all those organisms within our ecosystem, working together and respecting that knowledge, that wisdom that has unfolded um, through billions of years as all those organisms have evolved, interacted with each other and created a, a system of improvement. Um, human beings, ourselves, are pretty latecomers to the whole system, but we've had a very big impact on how um, we've interacted with that natural world. Um, and we're trying to remove how serious some of that impact has been, I guess. Um, we've probably been a little bit extractive in our mentality and thought that we might be able to be the key drivers of these systems. But really, our belief is that that ecosystem function is way more sophisticated and capable than we are as, as humans to even grasp what's going on a lot of the time. And so I guess taking a little step back as a human, not being the driver and having that humility and that love, respect and gratitude for what can be provided from a well-functioning ecosystem. Um, certainly given us more in return than we would ever have dreamt. And the key drivers for us in our learning has been the sheep. So I think by taking the pressure off them, um, enabling their gut microbiome to function as it should, I guess, first of all, taking off those artificial things like, as I mentioned, the grain feeding and drenching and things like that, that enabled them to then access what they needed. Um, we started off too trying to provide as much diversity in their pastures as possible. Originally, when we first started, we had the typical clover or ryegrass based pastures, you know, quite limited in the selection for the sheep. But fortunately on our home farm, we did have sections that were salt affected and we'd planted down to salt bushes or had natural occurring salt bushes and a bit of diversity there. And by the animals having access to those um, and then transferring whatever they needed to and from those parts of the country that weren't getting cropped, um, yeah, the animals health really quite skyrocketed and they showed us that that diversity was really key for them um, and their performance um, was quite exceptional. Their weight gain, their growth rates, their fibre production, and it's just continued to improve over the last 20 years to the point now that the wool is highly sought after from European markets, um, the softness, uh, the micron, the production is just really quite remarkable given that we don't really have a huge um, selection pressure on them from a genetic perspective. It's basically them driving, them showing me what they're capable of, um, which has been more than what I anticipated. But basically a complete um, pasture-fed system since, you know, 2001, um, and increasing the biodiversity of that over time. So 
Uh, fortunately, the properties that we've been working with now in Mollaren um, and now Kalani just recently, they've got some patches of native bushland on them, so the animals have got access to land that doesn't ever get cropped, plus the cropping land, and they can integrate all those elements there um, a lot at their own free will. We do have times when the um, we are a winter dominant growing season area and during that time is when we do bunch the animals up and move them around as a, as a bigger group. Um, but in the summertime if we don't have summer rain or active green growing plants um, other than the salt bushes and so forth, we do open up the gates and actually let them choose themselves so we actually work the animals more with water positioning um, than fencing in those times. Because bear in mind our history of leasing and adjusting livestock, we were going onto lots of different properties at times that didn't have adequate infrastructure to do, I guess, um, other management techniques. And we had to learn to work with the animals um, in other ways and we found water positioning was probably the most effective way we could work with um, the animals in the landscape and using a bit of our own hay so if there was parts of the landscape that they weren't going to or were really quite poor we could use a bit of hay to position and encourage them in that direction. Um, and for us using a self-replacing flock has been key because of that epigenetic change. Um, the wisdom of the mother in her grazing capacities the exposure of the lamb while still in utero to different um, nutrients that the mother might be selecting throughout the environment, pre-priming the system of that lamb so that when it was born it had a capacity and understanding, um, a responsiveness to what that landscape had available to it. And such, it's been so significant, I guess, um, with that microbiome um, nurturing that the animals can perform on country that we go on to new country exceptionally well, even though the, the land or the, the plant stuffs there originally might be fairly poor, their capacity to digest um, fibrous material and create the protein within their own rumen um, for them to grow well has been yeah, very significant. One of my favourite books, um, and I'm rereading it for the second time at the moment, is Braiding Sweetgrass. And it's written by a lady who was a botanist um, and of Native American descent. And she really talks a lot about um, the wisdom of natural processes and how in our Western society we've put humans as the top of the pyramid, I guess, as being the highest evolutionary factor. Um, but yet from their native view is the humans are actually on the bottom of the list because they're the, the newcomers on the block and we've actually got a lot to learn from all the other beings um, out there that have been around for a lot longer period of time than us and created ways and uh, developed ways um, of functioning well within our environment and she being a botanist has a strong interest in plants and talks about how the plants have evolved to grow food and medicine um, and then they give that away. So whether they're giving food away to microbes in the soil by pumping sugars into the soil to enhance progression there, but also feeding animals and ultimately humans as well, um, providing uh, nutritious, nutritious and diverse um, food stuff so that we can enhance our own health. So it really fitted well with everything we'd been working with on the farm. So it was really lovely to read from her perspective. And I guess um, given that we've come from a, a livestock based operation as well, I just wanted to add to what Robin had put there um, from the plant based side as we find that the animals then have become our maestros by integrating with the landscape, integrating with all different types of vegetation that you know, I guess that's our role, is to ensure that we can have that biodiverse vegetation available to the animals so that they can self-select and they can integrate that nutrition throughout the environment, enhance their health, enhance their landscape and environmental health, and then ultimately the human health um, through the food chain. So yeah, that the animal's really probably up at the higher part of the pyramid than um, ourselves, they're leading the way 
on our property. And some in key impacts then on the soil health. So I guess as part of the cropping program, um, very early on in the piece, being able to drop out fungicides and pesticides and so forth, which I guess have obvious links to the health of that soil and the plants growing within it. And reducing the synthetic fertilisers and eliminating them so that um, I guess it's the same as with taking the drenching out of the sheep and things so that we're really looking after the diversity of that microbiome within the soil as best we possibly can. And seeing you know, a lot of the fungal activity and then those um, microbial interactions then enabling that root penetration within the soil, um, rebuilding that soil structure so that the rainfall can penetrate and go deep. Because I guess, as you can imagine, in our environment where some years, hopefully not too often, but they had been in the last 10 of having only 100 mil growing season rainfall, um, you've got to be able to capture that and reduce that evaporative loss. Um, and then when you get some good seasons, you can have some really good longevity of green and production outcomes. So in reducing synthetic fertiliser use, we had to find alternatives of what we could do um, to continue encouraging. We have, you know, as with Australia, there's lots of very aged soils, and Western Australia in particular, a lot of very low fertility soils, um, high aluminium, high acidity. Uh, so, you know, you've got to try and do something to enhance the opportunities for plants growing within that. So when we looked at it, the key ones we thought of in nature was worms and Jane said to us in the very early days that if you're going to put something on your soil it needed to have gone through the gut of a worm first and I guess that made sense and as um, Nicola mentioned the natural intelligence of the worms provided they've got access to a diverse range of diet as well much as the sheep then what how they integrate that within their digestion and what they actually put out the other end um, it's up to their wisdom uh, how that gets mixed up and what it can then provide to the soil and the plants that um, it gets close to. And over time, the composting system as well, which was something that Elaine Ingham mentioned, was the use of uh, good quality compost. And over time, we've developed a capacity to make our own Johnson Sioux compost. Um, but you can see by also the, the sheep manure there, just the fungal activity that that generates itself um, once that gut microbiome and the animals is well restored and cared for, that the animals are doing a lot of that process just by moving around the landscape as well. So we've got it happening on the four legs all the time, um, but then through the cropping process, using the compost extract and, and the Nutrisoil to put it out there in more concentrated forms to support the crop growth and the root development um, with the cropping program. So we use a, a seed dressing, so we use Nutrisoil and Johnson Sioux as a seed dressing, and that really primes those plants to, I guess, be resistant to any soil pathogens, really get some root development happening quickly with really good rhizosheath development, so supporting and protecting that root so that plant can really get off to a flying start pushing through um, acid layers in the soil, pushing through compaction, and I'll have some pictures of that a bit later. And fortunately, coming across some wonderful scientists along the way to help us understand what we were seeing um, and give that scientific backup to what was going on. And we've been very fortunate to have Walter Yenner on farm several times, and he's really been a great support in understanding how plants and seeds and the whole system interacts to drive itself forward if it's given the opportunity, if we take the brakes off it. I think Walter uses the term of taking the foot off the throat of Mother Nature and letting have her have a crack at it instead of trying to suppress her. Looking under the microscope of what's actually happening within those rhizosheaths and seeing the fungal activity and knowing then that that fungi is there available to help those plants access whatever nutrients um, it can throughout a wider range of the soil. Um, and so that those soil, uh, plants then can produce 
all sorts of phytonutrients, which is so critical to our human health, but haven't really been recognised enough. We've just been looking at calories and perhaps protein and a few things like that, but missing those really integral links. On some more acidic soils and seeing um, still the same fungal activity going on in comparison to where a synthetic fertiliser fertilizer may have been used and reducing that capacity of the plant to access the, the microbial activity and support it. So we talked a little bit about um, ensuring that infiltration effect. So we all need to have that water getting into the soil. And I guess trying to handle some of those big rainfall events that you've got, and I guess there's a certain capacity limit there. But um, in our area, not that we have the floods too often, but um, just the dryness and the evaporative issues is something that we've really got to um, try and prepare for. Once we start supporting those plants and changing that soil ecology, we've found that the actual annual weed pressure does decline. So that's um, Western Australia is well known for some of the resistant radish plants, chemical resistant radish. And we found over a period of three to four years that radish becomes, well, it virtually disappears. So as that soil ecology changes, um, so does the plant spectrum. So with plant succession and so forth, and it strengthens the capacity for the other plants to, to grow well. Just an example there of some of the roots pushing into a highly acid um, compacted subsoil. So once with that support of the seed dressing, enabling those plants to, to do more, instead of having to use a mechanical means of deep ripping or applying lime, Western Australia's got a, a big history of moving the coast to the country. Um, and the people of Lancelin at the moment are up in arms because the sand dunes are vanishing on a daily basis. And what are the ramifications of that, of having the sand dunes move from the coast to the inland. We use liquid inject um, of Nutrisoil and the compost extract as well. Um, it was at 70 litres to the hectare, but now we're using about 50, just so it's a bit easier to handle the volumes with the size of the cropping program we've got. We're putting about 14,000 hectares of crop in each year, so it becomes a significant volume of product to handle. So we've dropped it down to about 50 litres to the hectare now. And a foliar spray uh, at about the five to six leaf stage, right through to flag emergence if need be, because it takes a little bit to get around the program. Just seeing some results um, on improving that acidity. So without having to apply lime, just seeing changes, um, moving the soils more towards neutral, just with that um, microbial effect around the greater root system. So interfacing with a larger area of the soil um, with the rhizosheath having a neutral um, pH and yeah, just the larger root systems and the microbes affecting the soil pH without other interventions. And I guess, of course, once you've got a microbial system actively in place and plants growing as much as you can year round, then your opportunities for carbon sequestration are enhanced. And we were fortunate enough to have some deep soil carbon testing done in 2012, which was able to demonstrate that, particularly at depth, because it had been a fairly dry decade prior to that. Um, and we thought, well, the top levels would be, you know, fairly, we weren't expecting much there because the labile carbon would have been fairly variable with the dry seasons. But what was really interesting was how, as with the root depths going down, that we were able to get the carbon deep into the soil and uh, even with drier seasons to be able to progress that. Stripping out nitrogen. Um, we spent a bit of time in the early days with the family each year. We'd go to all different parts of the country and talk to whatever farmers we could come across, usually under the recommendation of Dr Christine Jones or um, Helen and Hugo Disler from Farming Secrets, who knew a number of farmers that were doing things like reducing synthetic fertilisers or um, around the place so that we could see how these things work similarly. Because I guess when you're trying to do things differently, it's good to be able to talk to different people that have having a crack at the same sort of stuff and seeing how it was working for them. 
and we actually went down to a fella in Tasmania who was using irrigation um, to grow vegetables. Uh, so a fairly high output uh, farming system, but he was using worms um, and compost as well. And it was a really fantastic thing to see under irrigation and high rainfall zone that you could get similar outcomes, maintaining productivity, because um, I guess we were just the opposite extreme from that, but it was wonderful to see in that high production system um, how effective the same processes were. So being able to grow cereal crops without adding nitrogen, and I guess in the early days we didn't even have much of a legume phase. So when we did this deep soil testing, um, some of the uh, country they tested, we'd actually had in continuous cereal for up to seven years prior without a legume phase, but the nitrogen levels of that soil um, had improved way more than the neighbouring property, which had had a legume phase in it. So that microbial capacity to capture nitrogen for the atmosphere and put it even within a cereal phase was quite mind-blowing for us. And particularly on soil types um, such as this, where it's a deep white sand, um, yeah, not a lot of natural fertility going on there, but to still be able to grow those crops without um, NPK, um, yeah, it sort of opened our eyes a lot. So when you got to a soil that had a bit more clay in it, um, it was a lot easier to do, but to see it on the, the gutless sands sort of taught us a lot. And then just that water holding capacity, which we all need and how the crop can then withstand some of those climatic shocks, whether it be heat or dry spells or whatever, to be able to hang on and perform. I mentioned before about the changing soil ecology affecting um, weed pressure, but even just a rainfall event, just the difference in the plants that actually germinate as a result. So these photos were taken on the same day um, following a, a summer rain in 2011, I think it might have been, um, just across the fence. And the neighbour, he had some radish and melons germinate with the summer rain. A lot of it ran, ran off, um, whereas we had a lot of summer active plants which provided wonderful sheep feed, cooled that soil down immensely over the summer um, and would have been, you know, pumping carbon as well. So. As these systems unfold and uh, carbon projects come to the fore, where we're actually receiving more income from those kind of things, it's going to actually be a win-win situation. We haven't been involved in a carbon project yet, but it's certainly something we're going to be focusing on in the immediate term, um, because I guess they're another outcome of what you're doing and why not? Um, just cover crops and crimping, a multi-species cover crops is something we've embarked on probably in the last four or five years and seeing the crimping has been a, a wonderful way to utilise and return a lot of that material to the ground, um, keep it covered and keep it uh, cool but we also, that's primarily been because at the moment while we've taken on new country we haven't always had enough livestock whereas we would have probably preferred to utilise that with, with livestock and use their capacity to lay it down but if you haven't got that right at the time because we've had to be careful too in building livestock numbers with originally we had a continual run of dry seasons um, then we've had the last two have been really good seasons and very highly productive so when there's been a bit of excess we've played around with other things to see what happens and it's worked really well. Um, being able to crop into the, some of that crimped residue with a disc seeder um, using the native plants and yeah, just being able to maintain that cover. So I think the last couple of years of having some good seasons have enabled us to take some extra steps forward. Um, that crimped country there where the crops coming through was actually a wind eroded piece of uh, sand. Um, all the topsoil had gone. So yeah, really having to start it from scratch. So yeah, probably an organic matter of about 0.3%. So a pretty poor base to start with, but it'll come along. Just seeing some of the native grasses coming too when you have the soil ecology change, sorry? That, that muller muller, is, um, is that something that naturally came up? It is. Yeah. It's a native um, plant in WA. Originally it was 
not thought of being as good feed because in a high cropping system when you're using lots of nitrogen fertilisers it's actually quite bitter but once you take those nitrogen fertilisers out it becomes an incredible feed source and I was speaking to a scientist from Murdoch University who studied Mulla Mulla and she found that the nutrient capacity of it because it's got a massive taproot system um, was better than chicory so it would actually access way more nutrient and has that been recognised as probably the best plant to scavenge phosphorus um, with its root system so really quite an interesting plant but the taproot is very significant and can be you know this wide so when you look at people using um, what do you call it tillage radish and so forth that's a plant that can have a similar effect but it's totally adapted to its environment yep and it can handle dry seasons as well um, as we've got it green on the farm at the moment even though we haven't had any summer rain so it's a very persistent and strong plant but beautiful feed and beautiful protection and this is a, a paspalidium grass so this is I think it was about oh, yeah, well, 2018 it says, if that's when it was. Um, we had some good summer rain and just seeing after one year, it was the um, first 12 months of being able to crop that land and the summer rain came through and all the grasses came up exactly where the air cedar had been. So it showed just that ecological change in that strip where the grasses wanted to germinate. We didn't plant any of those. We hadn't seen it to that extent anywhere. Well, we hadn't seen those grasses on property at all. Um, and now we've got it over a large part of the farm amongst a lot of other different types of grasses that are continuing to come forward. So we've got the um, deep herd scientists coming out regularly to recognise or identify different grasses that we're seeing that we haven't been familiar with and they haven't been familiar with either. Um, and some of them they recognise have come from right up in the pastoral country and now showing up in our land. They may have always been there, who knows, but um, they certainly haven't been showing themselves until the environment got to a position where it, they could flourish. Um, we've got some great people working with us and Beck is one of them who's an avid photographer and takes some beautiful photographs around the place of different insects and reptiles and they, yeah, she's got a wonderful ambience about her and yeah, they seem to come out and seek her and say day, so she can get some wonderful photo opportunities. But just the joy of seeing um, the return of a lot of that biodiversity. Um, Western Australia is renowned for having some beautiful wildflowers and we're very fortunate to have them on the property as well. But just getting into the cropping land as well, seeing those wildflowers returning into the cropping land. Um, the economics fortunately have worked out well for us and I guess um, Part of that is being able to reduce those input costs and I guess that puts us in a reasonable position at the moment with input costs going through the roof for a lot of farmers currently. Um, we're talking to the farm consultant when we did our budget uh, about a week ago and he said, yeah, he's been doing some really good budgets because the last 12 months, two years have been fantastic for production in Western Australia. But the budgets going forward have been pretty scary and a lot of people are scratching their head and wondering how they're going to be able to you know, continue to make a, a good return because the wheat prices drop or whatever, um, it's looking pretty scary But because of the um, that input cost. But we've been able to keep a, a good um, operating efficiency of 56% and it was actually 55% this year so we've improved again. So if we can keep as much money in our pocket at the end of the day um, it gives you a good step going forward or good confidence I guess because she's a pretty unknown world out there at the moment pretty unknown outcomes from the global economy what's really going to happen but just being as prepared and um, you can just some examples of um, some of the crop this year on the wild catchum farm which has had 18 years without any synthetic fertilizers so I guess the typical mindset would be that it would fall off a cliff at some point, but it's actually continued to improve and perform. I guess that's where humility comes in again too, is realising that there's so much change going on out there. We aren't necessarily the, the key drivers of it for sure, but just being comfortable and accepting those changes and grateful for them and, and probably just rejoicing in some of the stuff that happens because it can be way better than you've ever thought possible. Part of our, um, 
I guess has been, when it, talking about building resilience, is having that mosaic throughout the landscape. So it's all at different stages, different things going on, so that um, if the seasonal conditions go a bit pear-shaped, you've got uh, different bits, so long-standing native pastures, um, other paddocks that might be in a cropping rotation, um, other ones that have had cover crops and building um, fodder reserves and native bushland with lots of uh, biodiverse uh, shrubs and that throughout it so that there's always something for the livestock to attend to but always something where live, um, insects and birds and reptiles and that can seek refuge as well. We've been slowly building a portfolio of land now that's conjoined so that there is um, a capacity for habitat restoration and animals, uh, livestock, flora and fauna to have safe places throughout it all. And we're also looking at um, that conjoined landscape now and its capacity to affect not only the small water cycle at a paddock level, but also that large water cycle. Um, fortunately, in the quarter district, probably 10 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago, a company, um, Carbon Conscious, did a big tree planting. They purchased a lot of some of the poorer, less productive land through the farmers through that area and planted a, a lot of trees and our farm actually now joins up to parts of that and the local farmers have noticed a change in the rainfall patterns where those trees have been. I think there'd be about 30,000 hectares or something planted there and then we've got our land joining up with it now. So I guess when you look at bacterial aerosols going up into the atmosphere to trigger rain cloud formation and when you look on the rain radars now there is there is a patch there that comes up regularly. So we're pretty excited to see how that might unfold. And there also has been um, a world first study done in Western Australia comparing um, the rainfall patterns on the east side of the rabbit proof fence compared to the agricultural land. And they've been recognising the decline in the rainfall patterns through the agricultural country. So we're thinking that if we can perhaps, yeah, re-inoculate through a large conjoined area, then what can be done for that rainfall patterns again. So some of the rainfall patterns seem to be coming down from the north more, which is pretty exciting um, if we can have something along that line. Restoring communities, um, we're getting lots of people coming on board now that don't necessarily have a farming background. Beck there in the middle with her bees, she's um, got a bees on farm and she was a school teacher and her daughter who's on the big tractor there, Rachel, She's our key tractor driver now, um, just a 20 year old young lady uh, who's, yeah, really embraced it all. A good crew of people that wanting to, I guess, look for different things, um, just living in with nature, being able to observe positive change is what really um, helps nourish them uh, and wanting to be part of what we're doing out there. We're currently um, working on building, strengthening relationships with some of the local Indigenous people because we've looking at our Kimberley time and the, what we learnt from the people there and just that capacity of uh, Indigenous people to understand landscape and our position and part of it and being part of it not the key drivers has been a really um, great understanding for us and how we can work together more to bring the best out of our landscape, but also more people, more opportunity there, because there's lots to be done out there still. Um, and I guess with rural population decline, there's not necessarily enough people to do it anymore. And um, we've got to encourage those opportunities. Something that have, we've looked at, the whole natural intelligence system, I guess, really works at facilitating what we call a positive epigenetic spiral. So once we started working, and this is something that just an awareness that evolved over time, once we started working on things like looking after the soil microbiome and seeing that in with the animals, I think that, and then eventually that transferring to the human microbiome, it sort of triggers different reactions, I guess, in your thinking process. And I think some of the science and the medical science now is starting to explore that. Um, how it impacts on mental health. Um, but I think it also impacts your ability to trust your own intuition. If that gut microbiome is putting out different signals and giving different messages, 
I think it does give you a capacity to feel more confident with that intuitive understanding. Um, because I guess we've got to look very closely at our diet with the amount of processed foods and what damage that is doing to our gut microbiome. I'm really looking forward to what Emma has to say and hopefully I'm saying stuff that's <laughs> familiar with what she's going to say as well. But um, yeah, and then with epigenetics, so with um, mothers and having children, um, exposing those children to the right foodstuffs and that what we've observed with the sheep. So that, and I guess that's one of the beauty of breeding livestock is they have a far quicker you know, reproductive cycle so we can see the impacts on the new generation a lot quicker than you can with humans and um, we've been amazed at the capacity and the improvement in those young sheep through what um, the progression of the soil pedogenesis in conjunction with the epigenetic progress of the animals um, and we know but just by consuming our own grown meat um, just the taste flavour tenderness has been phenomenal uh, we provide grain to a bakery and people have been able to report back to us as well just the flavour um, of the grains that you know get baked at the bakery uh, and even people that have had gluten intolerances have been able to consume that grain um, without having any disruption to their digestion so so much more that we need to look at uh, when you look at biodiverse landscapes and the products being grown and um, yeah, sold off those landscapes, what it truly is able to do for our health. Oops, hang on. Um, yeah, Robin Kimmerer talks a lot in her book Braiding Sweetgrass about reciprocity and that's something we're really embracing too, I guess, with our farming system now and what can we give back? And I guess as people, all of us um, need to look at that, what can we give back and how? Um, we feel that using things like the Nutrisoil and the compost and that is actually our ability to give back um, and providing safe home for biodiversity of all sorts of organisms as best possible, giving back to our environment so that it can continue to flourish and do what it needs to do. But I guess as um, the man on the street too, we all need to look at how we can um, contribute or give back to our planet as well. We've had a long history of extraction, um, perhaps a lot of disregard for the natural resources and take, take, take um, for profit, profit, profit. But really um, we've seen, you know, the wheels falling off that methodology fairly seriously. And what can we do? And I guess ultimately um, what we've seen from the people at the, going to the bakery, they're giving back by making their consumer choices. Um, where they spend their money, um, supporting those industries that are doing the right thing by the planet and our overall health. Um, and I guess we've been fortunate, as I mentioned before, with the, the wool production that um, Stella McCartney's <coughs> been purchasing our wool directly so that she can look at their responsibility um, of supporting, I guess, regenerative production right through the chain. And I guess wherever possible where we can do that in all sorts of agricultural industries, well, that's um, a great way to go. There's just some pictures there of the bakery in Perth. Meat, the wool, grains. Had them all tested for all sorts of different um, toxins or residues or whatever <coughs> and all coming up clear. And I guess that's that detox capacity of a functioning microbiome that it can detox whatever might be out in the atmosphere or the soils or whatever if they're degraded. And our next steps will be into further value adding um, and encouraging others to join us on that pathway and just enjoying the beauty of the place around us and the opportunity to be there. So hopefully um, I've touched on some of the things you might need to, yep. Yeah. Using about 50 litres a hectare, how much of that is neutral soil, how much of that is your... We put uh, four to five litres to the hectare of neutral soil and the rest of the 50 litres to the hectare is made up of the compost extract. So we don't add any water there, it's either neutral soil or compost extract, so it goes down neat. Are you diluting your own compost? Are you like, um, taking the extract yourself, um, extracting the... 
We've got um, a couple of 25,000 litre extractor tanks that have um, been custom built so that we can probably make 80 to 100,000 litres of compost extract a day to go out fairly quickly. Um, and that's been really effective. So we use about 800 kilos of compost to the, about 17,000 litres of water. We've actually built a couple of worm farms now so that we haven't been able to get um, worm castings from Nutrisoil because of the quarantine issues getting it across the border. So we started building um, our own worm farms on farms. So we will be adding to the compost with worm castings this year. So yeah, just, and that, I guess that's a good thing too, that we can actually build more of that capacity for, a, I guess, a circular type economy on farm, producing more of our own fertility. So we've got the Johnson Sioux where we use our own multi-species hay plus the manure from the sheep out of the shearing shed. So that's a great, that's one beauty of having a shearing shed that you can capture all that manure easily. And we've seen what that does itself, even with in the sheep yards, when we get some good rain that's prolonged, all the mushrooms that grow up in the sheep yard. So it's doing its Johnson Sioux on site as well. So um, yeah, that's really encouraging for us. So if things go to crap, we don't have to worry about importing fertilizers. We can, we've got it all there for ourselves to, to deal with.